the three lectures this morning, what I want to do is, in the first lecture, lay out some basic historical background, theological background to uh, Puritan piety. In the second lecture, I want to look at how uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is crucial to Puritan understanding of salvation. One of the things I think that Protestants don't do well is think and talk about the Trinity. Most, uh, my impression is, that, well, I'm saying most, but an awful lot of Protestants could probably get by quite happily with a Unitarian understanding of God. Yes, we all believe in the Trinity, but you ask the question, why do we believe in it? Why is it important? Uh, you often face some fairly blank expressions in churches. So in the second lecture, I want to bring out some of the uh, important elements of Trinitarianism in Puritan theology. And in the final lecture, I want to wrap that up by looking at the uh, importance of the identity of Jesus Christ in the context of the Trinity. And then finally, if you like, to get round to the, the topic on which I've been asked to lecture, and that's creedal Christianity, and make what I'm sure will be an extremely popular plea, perhaps for the use of creeds uh, in worship. I'm sure in a Baptist context that will... Uh, well, it will probably be useful for me to finish at that point and head for the airport. So, but... Don't foreclose your minds just yet. Wait until I reach that point before we decide whether I have anything useful to say or not on that issue. So the first lecture then, I want to set some background for uh, Reformation Protestant piety in general. And I want us to think about a number of themes at this point to, to set this, this lecture series in context. And the first thing I want us to think about is what exactly the Protestant Reformation does to the lives of ordinary Christian believers. It can be very difficult piecing together the life of ordinary Christian believers in the Reformation because many of them could not read or write. We don't have access, if you like, to their own reflections on how they thought about their Christian lives and how they went on being Christians. So I'm going to present to you now our I suppose slightly speculative, but I think well-grounded uh, ideas of what might well have been happening in the minds and the lives of ordinary Christians in the 16th and 17th centuries. And the first thing to reflect upon is justification by faith. Justification by faith is the most doctrinal of topics in many ways, but it is connected, intimately connected, with pastoral experience and pastoral practice. I had the privilege last night of speaking at the Principal's Banquet at TBS and I spoke about the importance of practical theology for Martin Luther. Justification by faith is the theological underpinning of what Luther is doing in the second decade of the 16th century. And Luther is doing something very radical in that second decade. He is arguing that assurance of salvation, the belief that God is gracious to you, should be the ordinary experience and ordinary possession of every Christian believer. And that is a dramatic change from what has gone on before. If you look at the standard textbooks of medieval theology, you will find that assurance of faith, the idea that you as an individual believer could know that God is gracious to you, that doesn't really cross the horizon of medieval theology. The only people who could be assured of their salvation were category of the super saints, if you like, who'd had a direct revelation from God that they were of the elect. And the assumption should always be that you are not one of them. And if you think you've had such a direct revelation, it's probably because you're mad, not because you're one of the elect. So assurance of faith was not a major player in the theology of the Middle Ages. That is not the case in the 16th century. In the 16th century, Martin Luther argues that every Christian believer, their normal experience should be that they know that God is gracious to them. God has revealed himself so dramatically, so wonderfully and so perfectly in Jesus Christ that grasping him by faith assures one of, God, of uh, God's favour towards one. Now think for a minute how that changes the lives of ordinary believers. you have been brought up in a system that has stood for centuries and assurance of faith has never been an issue for you. Suddenly, you are told that whatever else you've been told in the past, 
assurance of God's favour is now to be a basic part of your Christian experience. So if you like, the game on Christian experience is being raised to the nth degree in the 16th century Reformation. But what else is going on? Well, everything with which you are familiar and everything upon which you have relied, if you like, for your spiritual well-being is being stripped away at the same time. Because justification by faith isn't just an abstract doctrine that, you know, pops up in the church and the church simply teach this using the same old forms. Justification by faith actually changes an awful lot of that with which you are familiar. For example, if you think that salvation is about faith and if you think that the gospel is about a promise, then liturgy, preaching, well, preaching becomes more central and liturgy becomes vernacular. It becomes important to understand the words that are declared in church on a Sunday. The way that church is done starts to change. The best example I can think of this is um, if if you're in Europe and you go to one of the great uh, European cathedrals, uh, the cathedral in Cologne, for example, and you walk through the door of the cathedral in Cologne, what happens? Your eyes are immediately drawn down to the far end of the cathedral, where the altar is. Why are your eyes drawn down there? Because the church architecture is designed to reinforce the emphases of the worship that goes on there. What is the most important aspect of worship in a medieval cathedral? It's the Mass. So when you go into the church, your eyes are immediately drawn to the altar because that's where your eyes should be focused. If you go into St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, Where are your eyes drawn? Well, St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh has seating in a kind of circle. And at the centre of the circle, there is a pulpit. The architecture reflects the Protestant nature of the services that are to go on there. Your eyes are drawn to the most important aspect of worship that takes place in St. Giles Cathedral. And that is the preaching of the Word of God. So, everything with which you are familiar is being changed. The Latin Mass gives way to a vernacular liturgy. A sacramentally centred form of worship gives way to a word-based form of worship. So you not only are being told that you are to be assured of faith, that you are to have assurance of salvation, at that very moment when your life is being turned upside down in terms of what your spiritual expectation should be, the world of your church is being turned upside down in terms of what goes on there. What I'm trying to do at this point is to make the point that the Reformation, if you like, reshapes and refashions everything. Have you ever wondered why if you go into a Catholic church, it's just a different feel. It just feels different to a Protestant church. It feels different because... The aesthetics are set up differently and the aesthetics are set up differently because the theology is set up differently. So the first point then I want to make about spirituality today, if you like, is Protestant spirituality is very distinctive because of the importance of the doctrine of justification by faith within Protestantism. Second set of issues I want to look at. And I'm going to try and pull these together uh, under my third point in a minute. So, stay with me if you like. If the first two points don't automatically seem to follow one from the other. Second thing that happens in Protestantism, well as justification by faith, the scripture principle comes into play in understanding how worship and spirituality are to be shaped and formed. In the Middle Ages, Uh, Middle Ages, there is certainly an interest in Scripture. It's a Protestant myth that there was no preaching in the Middle Ages. It's a Protestant myth that medieval Catholics didn't take Scripture seriously. That's simply not true. Very easy to document that. But Scripture comes to play a significant role in the Reformation that it has not played in the medieval church. And that is, it is given a peculiar and unique authority outside of the teaching of the Roman magisterium. 
So the Bible, if you like, is liberated, one might say, from the papacy at the time of the Reformation. And it becomes the guiding principle for shaping theology and for shaping the nature of worship. After I look at the Reformation, I see... uh, If you look at the Magisterial Reformation, the Lutheran and the Reformed, we see sort of two streams of how the Reformation is understood relative to Scripture. They're not mutually exclusive, but I think there are distinctive emphases that mark out the two, and I would describe them in this way. The Lutheran Reformation sees the Reformation as a recovery of the Gospel message. That is the central thing. For Luther and for his followers, the Reformation is the recovery of the Gospel message, the recovery of justification by faith. And the Reformation follows a relatively conservative path in relation to that. That is why Lutheran churches often look quite like Catholic churches when you go into them. Luther and the Lutherans are interested in reforming the message of the Gospel. They are not so interested in radically overturning the practices of the church. Luther sees himself as a witness to the true gospel. On the reform side of things, when I think about the reform, and I think about men like John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, John Knox, I think the Reformation is understood not simply as a recovery of the gospel message, but it is also understood as a crusade against idolatry within the church. That's an important distinction. It's very interesting if you go to the end of uh, 1 John where uh, the Apostle says, the last verse says, you know, keep yourself from idols. And if you, go to a, if you go to Luther's commentary on that epistle, Luther tells you this verse doesn't apply anymore. It doesn't apply anymore because it was written in the Roman Empire and the person is talking specifically about Greek and Roman religion. And that idolatry is gone. If you go to a Reformed commentary on that epistle, you'll find it applied to contemporary Catholic practice. Keep yourself from graven images within the church. And the difference in that comment, I think, indicates the difference in how the two streams understood the Reformation. Lutherans see it as it's a recovery of the true gospel from works righteousness. The Reformed see it as a more broad thing. It's all part and parcel of crusade against idolatry within the church. And that's why if you read John Knox or even John Calvin, there is a tremendous passion in those men for the prophets of the Old Testament, particularly John Knox. No doubt in my mind, John Knox sees himself as a modern Ezekiel. What's John Knox doing? He's the watchman, pointing to idolatry, tearing down the idols. And this leads, of course, the reform to a much more radical critique of worship and piety than one finds in Lutheranism. It's a very interesting debate that goes on in Lutheranism in the late 1520s and the 1530s about language to be used in catechisms. Should they use the language of the Mass in Lutheran catechisms? Should the Lord's Supper be referred to as the Mass? And some Lutherans argue, no, you need to, get, you need to completely remake the language, get rid of the language of the Mass, and produce a new, pristine, pure language for conveying the pristine, pure gospel. Luther's position is very interesting. Luther says, no, we keep the old language. And we keep it for this reason. Getting rid of the old language, that disturbs people. We've got to operate as sensitive pastors here. We use the old language, but we subvert it by injecting new content. We use the language of the Mass, but we teach them the Lutheran understanding of the sacraments. And we do that because, as I said at the beginning, not only we're raising the bar, Christian experience, to the nth degree at the same time as we're ripping away everything with which these people are familiar. Pastoral sensitivity means we should use the language with which they're familiar, but subvert it by putting in our own Lutheran content. Reformed, however, are much more radical. The Reformed are much more on what I might call the left wing of Lutheranism. If the left wing Lutherans, the radical Lutherans, wanted to get rid of the language, the Reformed have much more sympathy with that. Reformed critiques of worship and spirituality are fashioned, I think, along the lines of Old Testament prophets, much more iconoclastic. The Reformed are trying to rebuild Jerusalem, if you like, from the foundations upwards. And I know I'm, uh, I'm speaking, I would guess, to a predominantly Baptist audience. I'm making the assumption that 
uh, Grace Baptists, their real spiritual forebears are in the Reformed of the Reformation, not the Anabaptists of the Reformation. I should probably throw that into the mix. Would that be a fair comment, do you think, Michael? So the Reformed then operates on a much more broad level of critique of worship. And this is important. It's important to understand why they offer this critique. So, if you like, when I come in lecture three and I make my plea for perhaps a limited use of creeds in worship, we can understand why we may have thrown them out in the first place and be able to evaluate whether it was a good reason or not. The reform gives birth to what is called the regulative principle of worship. The regulative principle comes up in various forms, but I'll give you a couple of historical examples of how it starts. Early 1550s, a man called John Hooper is appointed Bishop of Gloucester in uh, the United, uh, well, sorry, the United Kingdom. In England, it was not the United Kingdom, of course, in the 1550s. John Hooper is appointed Bishop of Gloucester. England is undergoing something of a Protestant Reformation at this time. Hooper is a man who studied abroad. He studied in Zurich under a man called Heinrich Bullinger. Bullinger is a leader of the Reformed wing of the Protestant Reformation. Hooper is appointed Bishop, but refuses to be consecrated. He refuses to be consecrated for this reason. The authorities want him to wear a white surplus for his consecration. And Hooper regards that as idolatry. Why does he regard it as idolatry? Because it is not required by Scripture. And Hooper operates on the basis that if something is not required by Scripture, it is implicitly forbidden by Scripture. Had Hooper been a Lutheran, he would have taken a more relaxed view. What is not forbidden by Scripture is permitted. But Hooper epitomises what will become a more thoroughly reformed attitude to worship. And that is, if it is not specified as required in Scripture, we cannot presume that it is permitted. Hooper will be thrown into prison and will finally relent and be consecrated wearing the surplus. He had to learn, I guess, a tough lesson in who ran the Church of England. And it was not the uh, Bishop of Gloucester elect, it was Thomas Cranmer and Bishop Ridley in London who ran the Church of England. Uh, Interestingly enough, I think if you look in the Latin, the early Latin edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Fox's Acts and Monuments, there is a brief allusion there to the fact that Hooper was threatened with the death penalty and relented under threat of the death penalty. But I've never seen any documentation elsewhere of that. That may have been a little bit of Fox speculation. But John Hooper then epitomises the reformed attitude to worship. John Knox even more dramatic figure than Hooper. Knox was uh, the bodyguard of a man called George Wishart, who was a Protestant preacher martyred in Scotland in the 1540s. Knox was later captured by the French and served 18 months on the French galleys. We have records from the Inquisition of people who would confess to more serious crimes than that with which they were charged in order to avoid doing time on the galleys and to get executed instead. Being on the galleys was... It was a long death sentence. You were on the galleys and you were worked to death and it was a long and terrible death. John Knox survived 18 months on the galleys. He must have been... He was the kind of person that I guess one would cross the street to avoid at night. He was a very tough and scary person. But Knox, more than anyone else, fashions, I think, certainly the British reformed understanding of worship. Knox when he was uh, released from the galleys on a sort of uh, prisoner exchange with the French, came to uh, work in England. His appeal to the English crown was twofold. One, he was a real hard hitter. He feared the face, apparently, of no man. Uh, So he could be dispatched to the far ends of the English kingdom to cause trouble. If you think, Reformation is based in London. By the time you get up to Durham in the north, you're a long way from London. It's very, very difficult to enforce the Reformation in Durham. What do you do? You send your leading Protestant troublemaker up there to make life difficult for the Catholic-leaning bishop of Durham. It also has the advantage of putting Knox near the Scottish border. Disillusioned Protestant Scots can come over the border and create border trouble, destabilise the border, keep the bishop occupied. It has the third advantage of putting a real troublemaker as far away from London as possible. If Knox is causing trouble for the Catholic Bishop of Durham, he is not causing trouble for the Protestant Bishop of London or the Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury. Knox came up with a very, very simple, one might almost say crude formula for the regulative principle of worship. Uh, 
Whatever is not required in Scripture is idolatry. The Mass is not required in Scripture, therefore the Mass is idolatry. And another, uh, for whatever practice has a wicked opinion attached to it or an unbiblical opinion attached to it is idolatry. The Mass has a wicked or unbiblical opinion attached to it, therefore the Mass is idolatry. So Knox lays out what will become the basic axiom for a later understanding of reform worship and reform spirituality. If it's not there in Scripture, it's forbidden. If it's not there in Scripture, it's idolatrous. One of the texts he would use for this is Saul and the Amalekites. Saul is told by the Lord God to go in and slay the Amalekites. Men, women, children, all of the livestock is to be put to the sword. What does Saul do? Saul spares the best of the cattle. Why does he spare the best of the cattle? He spares the best of the cattle to offer them as a sacrifice to the Lord. Samuel, of course, comes along and throws a fit. He says it's better to obey the word of the Lord than to offer sacrifice. And then there's that dramatic moment when Saul grasps uh, Samuel's cloak and Samuel pulls his cloak away from him and there's a, it rips and there's that bit left in Saul's hand and Saul sa- Samuel says, Today the Lord God has ripped the kingdom from your hand and given it to one better than you. Will be David and then ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. But that passage is very important for Knox because it told him this. It told him that motivation was not sanctification. That Saul's motives may have been the highest, but because he didn't do what God had said, he was condemned for his idolatry and the kingdom was ripped from his hand and given to another man, one better than he. So Knox really sets up what is called the regulative principle of worship, which I think has been both a positive and on another level uh, has been used in a negative way within reform practice and we'll come to that hopefully in lecture three. Over the hundred years after Knox, building towards the great Puritan crises of the 1640s and 1650s, the debates about the regulative principle of worship come to focus more and more on the Book of Common Prayer. The Book of Common Prayer contains various aspects that are not required in Scripture. Kneeling at communion being the most obvious. Knox has a few things to say about that in 1552. Kneeling at communion. um, The use of surfaces. This becomes something against which uh, the Puritans react with Uh, intense dislike. But it's worth thinking for a moment about another aspect of the regulated principle of worship. Because one of my arguments is going to be that the real antipathy in reformed circles to the use of creeds and the use of liturgy in worship is intimately connected with how the history of this unravelled within the English context. From the 1560s onwards, the Book of Common Prayer is used by the government in England as a means of social and political control. What do I mean by that? It was imposed by the government. It became the way that the government controlled what went on in church. It's hard for us, I think, often to think in the way that 16th and 17th century people thought. Sermons were incredibly powerful media in the 16th and 17th century. You didn't just go to church to hear the Bible expounded, you went to church to have your whole world shaped. It was your principal means of finding out what was going on in the world. There was no television. There were no newspapers. Preachers were incredibly powerful and influential people because they told people how the world operated. Think of the Puritans who came to New England. Every week in New England, one of the sermons would be on Providence. Why would the sermon be on providence in New England? It reminded the people in the pew of who they were and what their project in New England was. They were the chosen people of God brought providentially to the United States to build that city on the hill. Sermons, incredibly powerful things. If you're in government in the 16th century, you do not want people saying whatever they want from the pulpits. You want to control what's said in churches. And there's a kind of Janus face to the faith of the Book of Common Prayer, the liturgy of the English Reformation in the 16th and 17th century. 
On the one hand, it fulfills a very good purpose. If you think about it, Reformation takes place in London. You don't just sweep away everybody from every pulpit in England. It's more like what happened in Eastern Europe with the collapse of the, the Iron Curtain. A few faces at the top change, but on the whole, your local officials remain in place. That's how the Reformation takes place in Europe. The Catholic clergy are on the whole not swept away. They simply switch to Protestantism. How do you educate these people? How do you make sure they're giving their people good Protestant doctrine on a Sunday? You give them a liturgy. You give them a homily. So if they're totally ignorant of theology, but they can read, at least they can read a homily. So the Book of Common Prayer and the homilies of the Church of England, the things that were designed to shape English piety, were first and foremost, I think, tools of liberation, one might say. Tools of getting the truth to the people. But from the 1560s onwards, as uh, parties within the Church of England pushed for more and more something that approximated the regulative principle of worship, pushed more and more for the Church's right to control the Church's own affairs, the Book of Common Prayer and the homilies become not so much a means of liberation as a means of controlling what people hear at church on a Sunday. If you've got to read the homily, then you can't preach a sermon. If you've got to use the Book of Common Prayer, then you can't pray extemporaneously. And you can't be slipping in that little criticism of government policy there. Or of some favoured son or daughter of the government at that point. So what you have over the hundred years from, say, the 1550s to the 1640s is an intensification of debates surrounding the nature of reformed worship and reformed piety that come not simply to focus upon what the Bible says you can and can't do and how one understands that, but also it comes to focus on the freedom of the church to be the church. And the regulative principle, I think one of the things that's often missed in discussions of the regulative principle of worship is this, and that's that it's actually designed in its early phases, I think, to secure individual Christian freedom. Nobody can come into your church and make you sing a hymn that isn't in Scripture. They have no biblical warrant to do that. They have no power. The Bible gives them no power to do that. So the regular principle that we often think of these days, I think, is a restrictive thing that prevents us from having freedom in worship, however one might think of that, was in its initial phases, anyway, in the first hundred years or so, designed to try to curtail government interference in worship and establish the church's own right to be the church. Three marks of the church in Reformed Protestantism word, sacraments and discipline. If you like, the regulative principle reflects as much the third point as the first two. Freedom of the church to be the church and to do its own thing. But what happens, I think, what happens in that hundred years is that the use of liturgy and the use of creeds gets a bad name because the only experience the Puritans have of liturgy is something that the government is trying to impose on them and something that the government is using to control them with. And it's very interesting how when you move from people like Knox and Calvin down to somebody like John Owen, in that hundred years there is a definite shift between a deep sympathy for drawing on the history of the church as a way of finding language for worship and an antipathy to that. When you come to John Owen, we'll talk about Owen in a few minutes, Owen doesn't want any liturgy in church. And he'll give you theological reasons for it. But I think an awful lot of what Owen brings to his argument is baggage from the way the Book of Common Prayer was imposed on the church and used as a way of abusing the church in the hundred years between the 16th and the 17th centuries. That's my second point there. My first point was realise that the Reformation is not simply uh, changing the words or just changing the content of an otherwise continuous spirituality. Justification by faith is explosive in terms of church practice and Christian self-understanding. Secondly, realise that the Reformation uh, heralded a dramatic Reformation of worship, particularly on the reformed side. 
But maybe that reformation of worship was not what we all think it was. Maybe it was not as anti-traditional in some ways as it has been made out to be by some people. Just as an aside, one of the things I think that marks out Reformation Protestantism from much of modern evangelicalism is the Reformation respect for tradition in the past. That's important. You know, we tend to think of evangelicalism as it's a movement of one book, and so it is. The Bible is uniquely authoritative in evangelicalism. But that at no point meant that the evangelicals of the 16th and 17th centuries simply didn't bother listening to what had gone on in history. They had what I might describe as a hermeneutic of trust relative to tradition. Tradition was assumed to be correct until it was proven wrong. I think culturally today we have the opposite. Tradition is wrong unless by some amazing chance one can prove that it's correct. And that's pretty unlikely generally. And that is a cultural aesthetic. That is a cultural tendency. That is not a theological tendency, tendency born out of the Reformation. So we've done foundation in theology, we've done the, how the scripture principle connects to worship. Very briefly, I want to talk about the experiential emphasis that emerges and helps to shape piety and spirituality. First of all, the issue of assurance. The issue of assurance was not an issue before the Reformation. It becomes an issue at the Reformation. If you think about it, why is it that in the 17th century people are wrestling with problems of assurance? It's because the question has been asked. How can one be assured? That question isn't really asked in the Middle Ages. It can't be a problem. I'm told that uh, a blood transfusion was never a problem for Jehovah's Witnesses until somebody wrote to the watchtower and said, is it okay to have blood transfusions given these verses in the Bible? Suddenly it becomes a problem. Assurance is a bit like that in Protestantism. The piety that you find in the 17th century, which I want to talk about in, in, the, in the next lecture, is different in many ways to the piety you find of the reformers in the early 16th century. Why? Because you have a hundred years of pastoral practice working with problems that the reformers created. The, problems crea- the reformers created the problem of assurance by saying it should be the ordinary possession of every Christian believer. And it's not until the reformers make that explosive claim that pastors start have to wrestle, start having to wrestle with the problems that that claim generates for ordinary believers who have been told, A, you should be assured, and B, we're going to take away everything with which you're familiar, by the way. That is a recipe for pastoral disaster on the issue of assurance. So the first thing to notice in the 17th century is there is an increasing experiential emphasis and it partly arises as a result of questions that the Reformation is asking that were not asked before. The second reason why it arises peculiarly, I think, in Puritan spirituality is this. There is doctrinally not much difference between the Puritans and the mainstream Anglicans in the 17th century. Look at the 39 Articles. Puritans did not really have a problem with the 39 Articles. They had a problem with certain aspects of worship in the church. Some of the aesthetic practices of the church. And that leads to the question of, well, how do we separate the true believers from the less faithful or untrue believers? We can't do it doctrinally. So let's start to talk about Christian experience. So if you like, there's a positive side to the issue of assurance, and that is, it's wrestling with genuine problems that the reformers have created. And there is a somewhat negative side as well. And that is, we can start arguing for our superiority over those who appear to believe the same as we do by saying they don't have the special experience we have that validates us. And I think it's in the 17th century. uh, Parche, uh, the arguments of David Bevington, I think it's in the 17th century that one sees the birth of what will later become sort of evangelical conversionism. That really starts in the 17th century. It's not an 18th century phenomenon, I don't think. Next point. What else is shaping uh, piety in the 17th century? The rise of individualism. Individualism is a very difficult thing to define. It's one of those things that uh, most people regard as bad. Um, I would say to students, well, you know, individualism can be bad. Cartesian individualism, this idea that you can only be certain of your own existence, that strikes me as an inherently bad philosophical idea. Uh, but, 
you know, when I sit down to eat dinner, particularly with people I don't know, boy, am I glad that somebody invented knives and forks. You know, that we have the concept of the individual plate and the individual eating. You go to cultures where they don't have that concept and you're all, you go to Korea and you're drinking soup from a common bowl. To my Western individualistic perspective, I'm not comfortable with that. And I think I have good hygiene grounds for not being comfortable with that. So when I say the word individualism here, I'm not necessarily meaning it's good or bad. What happens in the 17th century though is people start moving to the cities. Families start breaking down. My wife comes from an island off the west coast of Scotland. She knows her second and third cousins twice removed. It's a small island community of a few thousand people. They're all interrelated. I learned very early on you don't make a joke about anybody on the island because you're going to be offending somebody in the room. I come from a city. I was born in a city. I just about know who my cousins are. 16th and 17th century, people start moving to the cities. Communities start getting broken up. Piety starts to become more individual at this point. People start to think about their Christian lives very much in terms of themselves. I think, I can't prove this, but I have an instinctive feeling that the whole notion of the quiet time probably begins in the 17th century. Certainly don't get much about it in the Middle Ages. Michael can probably correct me from the patristic, but I don't find much about it in the patristic authors I read. There's certainly a concept of a certain amount of individual piety there, but it's not where the emphasis lies. The emphasis lies on the gathering of the church, or perhaps on the family. The idea of the individual quiet time as the barometer of spiritual health, I think that's something that emerges really in the 17th century and beyond, because the communal nature of life is slowly but surely being broken up. And it's the same for both Protestants and Catholics. And you have the rise of what is called casuistry in the 17th century. Books, I suppose the greatest Protestant example would be Richard Baxter's Christian Directory. A book that an individual can own. When you have a problem, you go and look the problem up in the book and it gives you the biblical solution. Past, you wouldn't have needed that because part of a stable community. You knew where everything was. Reformation has changed everything. The rise of the modern city is changing everything. People are having to rely upon themselves more. And handbooks of how to live the Christian life become useful because you may not be able to call on your priest or your pastor with the ease and convenience that you did before. And there's some interesting stories of Casuistry is interesting, so this case of conscience is because uh, it's where Protestantism and Catholicism kind of come back together. It's a very interesting uh, book of Puritan casuistry. Uh, a friend of mine brought my attention to this friend. A, he's a Catholic, he happens to be a former Jesuit, but he's now married. And he did a lot, of, a lot of work on 17th century casuistry. And he was reading this book of Puritan casuistry. And he thought, I've read this book before. But I've, I'm, I'm certain I've not pulled this Puritan off the shelf and read this book of Puritan casuistry. Then the penny dropped. It was actually a Catholic book of casuistry that some Puritan had got hold of um, and plagiarised, changed the name, passed it off as his own piece of work, removed the bits about the Mass and the Pope that might be offensive to Protestant ears and had passed this book of Protestant casuistry off as a good piece of Puritan work. And the the rather nasty twist in the tale was my friend told me he'd done some research on this uh, Puritan character. The Puritan character had actually been involved on the committee that had sentenced the priest who had written this to death. Um, so it was a sort of rather nasty twist in the tale. But piety, Reformation, profoundly shaped by the rise of individualism. And that is something I think that we'll come back to in Lecture 3. It has an impact upon the way the Puritans um, reflect upon the nature of piety. So to summarise then, very briefly, justification by faith changes everything. It shatters the way church is done. It shatters the way individuals think about themselves and their relation to the church. The scripture principle comes in as a means of correcting and reforming worship. You have the birth of the regulative principle, wrestling with issues of church and state and of freedom. And then thirdly, you have this experiential emphasis generated in large to a large extent by the emphasis upon justification by faith and the pastoral problems that creates, which are exacerbated by the transformation of worship 
under the impact of things like the regulative principle. In the second lecture today, I want to make the case for understanding uh, Reformed theology as Trinitarian. And then in the third lecture, I want to raise the question ultimately of how do we go about then making Protestant worship truly Trinitarian? What's the best way we can do that? And I'm going to argue that uh, that is a vital necessity at this point in history. As I drove, was driven from the airport yesterday, spotted a mosque on, on the way from the airport. How are you going to tell your Islamic neighbours that the God of Abraham that you worship is not the God of Abraham that they worship? I tell you the truth, the Trinity is the best way of doing that. Anyway, I think I've slightly overrun my time. We'll call a break there and we'll reconvene 10 minutes, quarter of an hour to, to do lecture two.